So, uh, because we were so um, inspired, or the first idea came from this Gilles Deleuze ABCDR, uh, we decided to do the first letter A with animal. And uh, now I'm going to show you, so this is the first letter A. currency and D becomes digital so Bitcoin is digital currency also anonymous and also it's distributed digital currency and when it's anonymous it's also cash because cash is kind of you can uh, stay anonymous then it's also decentralized uh, when it comes to E it's efficient the promise is that it's more efficient than any other currency we know also, it's about electricity and energy because you spend electricity in order to support that whole uh, infrastructure. When it comes to F, it's also fraud. Then, I move a little bit to money. So, money is medium of exchange, it's unit of 
account, its store of value, uh, it's also a social phenomenon. It happens in between people. Money happens in between people. So let's go to the simplest one. And that's the, that's, um, that's the one in between. No, I'll go back. I'll tell you a little bit more about the Bitcoin. In 2009, it was introduced by Satoshi Nakamoto. We still don't know who's that guy. He introduced that to a very small group of cypherpunks. It's like a cryptography people. And then it got two years, and it was accepted with a larger group of people, still not like the largest, and it's, it's hackers. And I bought my first Bitcoins for 80 cents per Bitcoin in 2011. In November of 2012, one Bitcoin had a price of a thousand US dollars. And I cashed out two Bitcoins and bought this computer. And this is the most expensive computer I've ever had. I paid for that like a dollar and sixty cents. My friend was using another service which is called Silk Road, which where you can stay anonymous and also play with this digital distributed anonymous money. And then there was a chance for him to buy drugs without any face-to-face -face contact with his drug dealer. And he was using bitcoins for that for a while, and then in November of 2012, he was trying to calculate if he only saved that bitcoins and cash out in November of 2012, how much he would get. It was 600,000 US dollars. Okay, so let's go back, simplest one. So in between people, so what if people are friends, if they trust to each other and if they are like face to face, they don't really need any money. They can borrow something, they can support each other, but there is a problem. If they want to maintain that friendship, it's sometimes it's hard if there is a no log of that, if you can't remember what happened. So at least they have to trust not just to themselves, but also to trust to the memory, to the human memory. So if they can actually maintain that. That's why they would need something else, not just the memory, but some, a piece of paper, whatever it will remind them about their borrowings. So, so we have a distance, we have a trust here, and then just uh, through, the, through the time, it, it, it's not a history of money. This is just abstracting that, analyzing what is money. And then at one moment, we've got kings who would claim that they can guarantee that, that they can make that memory, they can become our collective memory for all of the borrowings. And people didn't really like uh, choose that. It was like enforced, as you know. And then we got governments who replaced kings. Some of them were killed, some of them are stay, stay, still alive, but they can't guarantee the money. Then we got banks. We got credit cards. These are all institutions which can guarantee and make a memory of, of what was going on in the money system. So Bitcoin proposes that we have to trust to computers doing math or doing cryptography. So we run a computer, it runs the cryptography algorithm, and we trust it enough so it can replace all of these institutions. And why we also trust it? Because that digital network, anyone can, theoretically, anyone can join that support it with its own computer, doing that mathematics, doing that cryptography. So in a sense, it's seen as a distributed network which is fair, which has no central authority, and which can replace money as we know it. And here, I'm not trying to say that, di that digital currency, that Bitcoin, is something which, uh, which should replace money, I usually say that it's fraud, it's run by selfish libertarians, it's ideologically very dangerous, but it shows the power of abstraction when it's used with electricity. So C is catalog. And uh, when, I, when I arrived uh, here, I brought a lot of uh, images with me. And uh, I, pu I put them in this little drawer here. And um, I want to show them to you because they're very nice. They are from another, another time. But I, I, maybe you have to come, to come closer to watch them. Because like, they are like picturesque views of uh, volcanoes 
like older uh, or older views. They are like uh, uh, flamingos. They are like Chinese guys. They are like uh, I don't know how you say this. Uh, uh, uh You have like uh, uh, what they call indigenous. You had like the big the big snake. You have birds. You have Chinese people. You have a snake. You have uh, uh, fantastic creatures. You have like monkeys. You have uh, a picture of Sudan, you have uh, salmon, you have uh, herbs, you have flowers, you have a fire, you have a volcano erupting, you have birds, you have a picture of atlas, you have uh, uh, flowers, another flowers, flower, you have uh, fantastic uh, uh, um, stones, you have another uh, uh, volcano, you have birds, you have uh, a map of uh, Holland, you have uh, a map of the sky, you have another map of the sky, you have a, another picture of Sudan, a map of the sky again, you have uh, pictures of uh, people with lepra, uh, another, the same picture, a uh, colonialist picture, uh, indigenous people, another woman, Indians, Indians in action, America, uh, uh, the conquest of America, the birds of America, the same picture again, and another picture of Lepra. This is it. because they have a greater distance to travel in the same length of time. When a wagon turns a corner, the wheels can travel at different speeds because each one can turn freely on the axles. And in the early automobiles, the rear wheels turned separately and only one wheel was connected to the engine. But when only one wheel was driven by the engine, it had to do all the work and it couldn't get a good enough grip on the road to do its job properly. So the one wheel drive was soon out of date. But if two wheels are locked on an axle so that they are not free to turn separately, one or the other has to slide. So engineers had to find a way to connect both rear wheels to the engine without sliding and slipping on turns. The device which makes this possible 
is a part of the rear axle. It is called the differential because it can drive the rear wheels at different speeds. The differential looks complicated, but once we understand its principle, it is amazingly simple. These two wheels are mounted on separate axles and supported by a frame so that they can revolve freely at different speeds. Let's fasten a spoke on the inner end of each axle so that by turning the spokes we can turn each wheel separately. With a bar or cross piece we can turn both wheels in the same direction at the same rate of speed. Let's get something to hold this bar in place so that it will press against the spokes. Notice that this support is not locked to the axle. It turns freely. Now we can spin the wheels by rotating the support. This is fine as long as both wheels are able to turn at the same speed. But, let's see what happens when we go around the corner. With this arrangement, we cannot drive one wheel faster than the other. And if we stop one wheel, the other wheel won't budge. Let's put this bar on a pivot so that it can swing in either direction. Now, the bar can still turn both wheels at the same speed. And because it pivots, it lets one wheel turn even when the other is stopped. But if turned too far, the bar will swing around until it won't drive the spokes that turn either wheel. We need another crossbar and more spokes to carry on the job. When we stop one wheel, the crossbars will continue to push the spokes of the free wheel around. As long as both wheels are free to turn, the bars do not swing on their pivot and the wheels move at the same speed. Now we have the working principles of a differential. To adapt the model for use in an automobile, we will have to make a few changes. In order to reduce the jerky action caused by wide spaces between the spokes, we will put in more spokes. <laughs> Further filling in the spaces between the spokes gives steadier, more continuous action. And changing the shape gives firm, constant contact. Now we can make the gears thicker and stronger, and we have differential gears. The edges are cut so that they will fit together more smoothly and silently. And another gear is added to share the work of driving the axles. The principle is the same. In order to turn the support and drive the wheels, we can fasten a large gear here, connected by a smaller gear to a source of power. Notice that the power is connected to the differential at the center line. We can make our model more compact by moving the gears closer together. When we put our differential in an automobile, we have to leave room for the drive shaft, which carries the power from the engine. We may build the floor of the car above the drive shaft.
that would be four comma. <clears throat> so I will start with the uh, destruction in art symposium. It was a symposium in 1966 initiated and led by Gustav Metzger, who is also known to um, do like a manifesto of uh, destruction art, art, art of destruction. Um, <clears throat> so he was also painting with, um, I can show you that. Um, Painting with the uh, with the acid. So you can see what happens to canvas. <clears throat> then when it came to digital, Jody.org is like very um, <clears throat> it's, it's just like following up on these gestures which are recognized in the art world where uh, art of destruction is the way how you can deal with the art history and how you can how you can express um, rather strong, um, rather strong statements. Uh, then we we got something interesting that Transmedia at the moment by Alex McLean. <clears throat> so he did a fourth bomb, and it says that it's a it's a short section of code which, when exec executed, gradually disables the computer system. The state of this system during this time can be seen on display in rather clumsy notation consisting of zeros and ones. See text uh, microanalysis. So what he was doing is that um, that he wrote um, a rather short script in Perl programming language, and um, it's like 13 lines of code, and it's something which hackers, and this comes from the hackers culture, wouldn't really like a uh, Call art for for sure. Also, not elegant, not beauty. It doesn't. I, I'm not trying to say that art is only about beauty, but just like if there is a beauty, that is not for sure something which is beautiful in in, in the hackers' world. And this is what hackers would uh, call beautiful. So this is 13 characters instead of 13 lines, and it does the same. So there is a function with the columns, and its definition of the function is columns in parentheses. Then there is a body of the function, and in the body of that, you can see that it's calling these columns, which is the name of the function, and then it will just pipe it into another, the same function, columns, which will go into the, uh, into the background. And then at the end, it will just call the whole the whole thing. So that just represents the recursive loop where the function calls itself and it goes up to the enormous number of processes and then it crashes the computer. He got a he got a he got a award at the Transmedia. So you can see it here this resonates with hackers but also hipsters. So you can also have it as a, as, as a tattoo. And this was done by a Jeremy, an Italian hacker, who did, uh, who did this, uh, this code. Excuse me, yeah. this is the code that is crashing computers? Yes, if you run it in your terminal. So it, had, it has to be executed, just like this one. Uh -huh. This one also had to be somehow executed. And when you execute it, the output is that it crashes your computer. So here it was in this like a trajectory of the destruction art, but then Jeremy just made it also as some kind of a reaction of why the fuck this, which is ugly, not elegant, not representing any kind of practice of, of, of programming in a way, why that is becoming whatever, the representative of the, 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 the great hack. So, <clears throat> Then later on, uh, uh, Jeremy. That, that's also an interesting story, just to like to tell you like how the world of hackers uh, uh, work. Then it got into the Wikipedia article about the fork bombs, which is more rather like a technical term. But then Wikipedians didn't want to add this into that as a reference to art first because it didn't have enough of references. 
But then also, because they found out that this was actually in a signature of a Polish guy in the middle 90s. And then Jeremy was trying to say to the Wikipedians that he was doing something like Andy Warhol. But hackers and Wikipedians didn't care at all. So they don't see this as art. <laughs> So now we are G, right? Ah, yeah. We are, we are, G. We are in G. Yeah, yeah. G is good. <coughs> G is good. G is good. Yeah. So. Okay. We have five minutes for good. So this is like uh, this video is look good. It's good. <laughs> If you prefer chocolate. Chocolate is good. Which is better? Hmm? Let's just which is better. Which is better? No, it's just good. <laughs> good for the camera? For the other camera? Yeah. Chocolate. Mm. So, we have still four minutes. So we have to Maybe we can have a minute to speak good conversation. <laughs> yeah. can, we, can we just enjoy the good? <clears throat> For four minutes? Oh. Maybe it, it's the time maybe to, to uh, explain this. What do you think? Oh? Or, let's see. Maybe later on. Okay. Huh? But if anybody wants a glass of water, there's also a water there next to the good. It's also actually pretty good water. Well, it's good. I don't like it, but it's good. <laughs> I mean, not that I don't like it, it's just that uh, I prefer sweet drink than water. Um, let's go on. Let's go on. Because every okay, when we are at the age, <clears throat> I need just a little bit to prepare it because it's also very for me it's something which is very important so I need like a a good half a minute So it's age and it's hero. I'll start with a quote from uh, Frederick Jameson. It is now easier to imagine the end of the world than to imagine the end of capitalism. And I'll paraphrase that for, for the purpose of, of age here, for hero. It is now easier to imagine comics superheroes as the only heroes left in the world of capitalism. Freedom fighters became terrorists. And here I'm not interested in the idea of little heroes, of a regular daily life, or of surviving in the precarious conditions of today's, of today's society. I'm interested in the closest meaning of true heroes as I can get. No irony, no cynicism. And my true hero is Aaron Schwartz. So, just a little bit about Aaron Schwartz. He downloaded 4 million scientific articles from JSTOR. Then he got arrested. And later, he was charged with two counts of wire fraud and 11 violations of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. He was carrying, he was facing cumulative maximum penalty of a million dollars and 35 years in jail. Aaron committed suicide on January 11, 2013, age 26. I'll read his guerrilla uh, open access manifesto. Information is power, but like all power, there are those who want to keep it for themselves. 
the world's entire scientific and cultural heritage published over centuries in books and journals is increasingly being digitized and locked up by a handful of private corporations. Want to read the papers featuring the most famous results of the sciences? You need to uh, send enormous amounts to publishers like Reed Elsevier. There are those struggling to change this. The open access movement has fought valiantly to ensure that sciences do not sign their copyrights away, but instead ensure their work is published on the internet and the terms that allow anyone to access it. But even under the best scenarios, their work will only apply to things published in the future. Everything up until now will have been lost. That is too high price to pay. Forcing academics to pay money to read the work of their colleagues, scanning entire libraries but only allowing the folks at Google to read them, providing scientific articles to those at elite university in the first world, but not to children in the global south. It's outrageous and unacceptable. I agree, many say, but what can we do? The companies call the copyrights, they make uh, enormous amounts of money by charging for access, and it's perfectly legal. There is nothing we can do to stop that. But there is something we can, something that's already been done. We can fight back. Those with access to these resources, students, librarians, scientists, you have been given a privilege. You get to feed at this banquet of knowledge while the rest of the world is locked up. But you need not, indeed, morally. You cannot keep this privilege for yourself. You have a duty to share it with the world, and you have trading passwords with colleagues, filling download requests for friends. Meanwhile, those who have been locked out are not staying idle by. You have been sneaking through holes and climbing over fences, liberating the information locked up by the publishers and sharing them with your friends. But all of this action goes uh, in the dark, hidden underground. It's called stealing or piracy as if sharing a wealth of knowledge were the moral equivalent of plundering a ship and murdering its crew. But sharing isn't immoral, it's moral imperative. Um, sorry, I, I lost myself. Only those blinded by greed would refuse to let a friend make a copy. <laughs> Large corporations, of course, are blinded by greed. The laws under which they operate require it. Their, sh their shareholders would revolt at anything else, and the politicians they have bought off back them, passing laws giving them the exclusive power to decide who can make copies. There is no justice in following unjust laws. It's time to come into the light and, in the grand tradition of civil disobedience, declare our opposition to this private theft of public culture. We need to take information wherever it is stored, make our copies and share them with the world. We need to take stuff that's out of copyright and add it to the archive. We need to buy secret databases and put them on the web. We need to download scientific journals and upload them to file sharing networks. We need to fight for guerrilla open access. With enough of us around the world, we will not just send a strong message opposing the privatization of knowledge, we'll make it a thing of the past. Will you join us? Aaron Schwartz, July 2008. That's about heroes. Okay, the next one is E. It's Icon.
So here I'll do uh, just a position J. Uh, and I will <clears throat> I'll use here the excerpts from uh, Understanding Comics. Uh, this is in, in this uh, library, which you can uh, you can find this book in, in, in the library in lecture books. Uh, it's um, for me the, the the foundation of uh, media theory. Whenever I have to recommend a book about media theory, I always start with this one. Uh, and I will follow up on what what, what we saw on the icon. Um, here I will. So. This is the comic about comics, to understand comics. And this is like uh, uh, some of the pages trying to get into the definition of, uh, of comics. And this is after like a number of, uh, of, of pictures where it says it's juxtap juxtaposed pictorial and other images in deliberate sequence. And then he talks to the, uh, to the audience and trying to get what would be the comic. But, um, so let's say that it's juxtaposed pictorial and other images in deliberate sequence. Then there is my favorite part of the book in chapter 2. Um, so he says, here's a painting by Magritte called The Tre Treachery of Images. I always like, embarrass myself with ignorance here, not knowing. The inscription is in French translated, it means this is not a pipe. Can you please say this in the scene of Exactly. And indeed, this is not a pipe. This is a painting of a pipe, right? Well, actually that's wrong. This is not painting of a pipe. This is a drawing of a painting of a pipe. French? No, wrong again. It's a printed copy of a drawing of a painting of a pipe. And I would say, no, this is the screen representation of a printed copy of a drawing of a painting of a pipe. Or, I would say, this is the, the canvas of a projector of a screen representation of a printed copy of a drawing of a painting of a pipe. So this is for sure not a pipe. And he says 10 copies actually, but I don't know like how many, 6 if you fold the pages back. Do you hear what I'm saying? If you do, have you check because no one said a word. But here, it's not true because I was saying what he was just saying. So this is my favorite. This is my favorite uh, 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 comics, and this is my favorite um, the the new, uh, media theory in a sense. And I would like just to show a few of your images. Maybe you can get them back. Really? Mm -hmm. uh, oh, the the, the the oh, I can also. I have it here. So, <coughs> yeah, now we are yeah, doing real just yeah, okay. okay. So we have a couple of these here. So what I'm interested, what what's the what's the thing which I'm interested in here is the juxtaposition, which is not necessarily in space, which is not like getting one on the left, or one on the right, but I'm interested in in this anticipation, in the ju juxtaposition of anticipation of time and the painting which will age. So in a sense, it's not just black square, it's not just black. Because there is a material kind of, there is a life of this painting, and then it will get, it will get some age, and you would be able to see it. But then, also at that time you would know that there will be a photography of that. And that photography usually doesn't try to represent the, the aging, but it tries to represent the idea, the ideal of that painting. But then that photography is the, 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 that's, that's what we will see. But then at one moment that photography is like, when we digitize that, do we really want to see the photography with the differences in between photography and that painting which was trying to capture? Or we want just go that closer to that idea? So then when it gets digitized, it's about the screen. And then there is also just a position of every view of that. Of of now we are watching, uh, oh, hey, you moved it, but we had like at least like two images of a black square. One is like from your context, and there is a juxtaposition of different contexts. 
So there is one which you brought, which is under I, and there is another one which I brought, which is under J. And we have like two projectors, and... And the one is projecting very wide, and the other one not. Yeah. So this is the juxtaposition which I'm interested in. I okay. can go on forever, but... Yeah, uh, but we are I'm at the end. <laughs> and actually, when we were, when we were preparing this uh, presentation, we... We always had a problem with uh, with uh, J, and then we found. But then we found something for J, but we lost something for M. So we don't have anything K. for M. M. K. No, for K. For K. For yeah, J. Yeah, J. K. K. Yeah. So uh, because we don't have anything for K, I'm gonna read aloud what this book is uh, producing since the beginning of the presentation. Bouvard et Décuchet, Gustave Flaubert, Financial Room Threatened, 3000, 3000 number, following 2099 and preceding 3001. A recurring conflict between Fyodor Pavlovich and his eldest son Dimitri Fyodorovich involved a sum of 3000 rubles. Public library, accessible by the general public, power professionals, A to Z, Gilles Deleuze, Animal, Animalis meaning having breath, A. The letter A currently represents six different vowel sounds. Great vowel shift, donkey, African wild ass. This usage is erroneous since the International Commission on Zoological Nomenclature has conserved the name Ecus Africanus in, op in opinion 2027. Correct scientific name of the donkey is E. Africanus Azinus. As beasts of burden and companions, asses and donkeys have worked together with humans for millennia. Working animal, domestication, B. Bitcoin, an anonymous, anonymous group. The group is also associated with the satirical open wiki encyclopedia dramatica. Currency, efficiency, economics, fraud, money. Satoshi Nakamoto, Silk Road, trade and cultural transmission routes that were central to cultural interaction, Silk Road Marketplace, characterized as humanitarian idealist and criminal, alleged masterminded and founder Ulbricht, pled not guilty, memory, process in which information is encoded, stored and retrieved, wait a minute, King, Governments, banks, bank, trust, cryptography, constructing and analyzing protocols that overcome the influence of adversaries, abstraction, C, seeing copyright symbols, catalog, volcanoes, flamingo. The only genus in the family Phonicopetiraceae, Chinese people, race, heredity reasons, nationality, citizenship, place of residence, geographical factors, and ancestry. Historical and gene genealogical factors can be used to define someone as Chinese. List of ethnic groups of China, map, colonialist, Victor McLagan, the informal film, advertising, a category called affective labor, the informer, 1912 film, Prints of the film survive at the film archive of the Library of Congress, Axel, Axel, Differential, a differential couple couples a drive shaft to a half shaft. In the 20th century, large assemblies of many differentials were used as analog computers. Analog computer, analog computers do not suffer. Spokes, drive shaft, drive shafts frequently incorporate one or more universal joints. Universal joint, Glimble. Etc. Etc. I would say. So these are these are uh, entries that Rob is uh, writing on his computer, and and the entries on Wikipedia. That's it. No. Entirely from Wikipedia. Yeah, I'm but you are you are you are you are. I'm certain Wikipedia. Okay, and you are you are uh, writing these keywords all the time. Okay. Also. Uh, I like this project. This is much more than just this printing. There is a great uh, user interface, and later on, I recommend you to check out uh, the work uh, uh, of Rob. 
Robert Hoxton, you can also check it on the internet. It's a beautiful reader of Wikipedia, where you just get like a continuous, eternal, almost in eternity, a continuous one page, which goes like this river. And uh, if, when you click on that, it just like brings the new reference and makes like a huge kind of river of uh, references. On the sidebar, you will see all of the ref references. So yeah, check it out. Uh, I try to explain it a little bit. <clears throat> and now we have L, and that's the library. And um, I make a difference. This is a um, project which I do with, uh, with the others. Uh, you will recognize some of, the, some of the references to what uh, Aaron Schwartz was doing. Uh, it's uh, <clears throat> he did like huge. I can't express how much he did. Uh, one can do more than what he did. This attempt, at, at the moment, it's, um, it's well accepted and recognized in the art uh, circles, but I hope that it will become also uh, better in, in terms of uh, infrastructure. There are thousands, not hundreds of thousands of books which you can get, but you can also get them from, from other sources. Anyway, I make a big difference between library and public library. So, library is a fantasy that we humans are able to collect all the knowledge which is known. But public library is something which we humans started to think of in the 19th century, where we started to think about public, when we started to think about equal rights of all people, of the access to the information, of getting uh, uh, equality through bringing free access to knowledge, for every member of society. So in that sense, in the catalog, if there will be a catalog of, of history, public library will be listed in the category of phenomena that the humans are most proud of. Together with free public education, public health care, scientific method, universal declaration of human rights, Wikipedia, and free software. And these days, a public library as an institution, which, used to, which is established from at least the beginning of the 20th century is under huge threat. So when it comes to digital books, public libraries cannot get digital books, they cannot buy it because publishers will not allow them. They say no books, no digital books for public libraries. Some of the publishers will let them buy it, but then after 26 borrowings, they have to buy another one. So there is extra labor by programmers to make a technology which can count these 26 borrowings. And it goes absolutely against anything what today's technology is. At the same time, it's losing support because of the economic crisis. So it seems that the neoliberal whatever paradigm is that just like shutting them down because of austerity measures. Also, one of the reasons is and will be that it didn't get adopted to the today's world. And of course, it, it cannot get adopted because it's not allowed. So in that sense, there is a, it's easy to, to imagine that public library will just disappear from our history and that it will have its existence only for 100 years. So uh, this project is about, is about a proof of concept technically, but also uh, trying to actually get into the, um, conceptually, trying to define. So I would say that it, it goes and follows the lines of the media theory, trying to teach a little bit, but also have a strong statement. So it's library and it's books, because the signifier in a society for the knowledge is books, is book. We can say it for file sharing, but it will not be that strong, because people, are not that much into media theory to make that to make that connection. So here is a proposal of a public library definition, and that's that public library is free access to books for every member of society, that it has to have a library catalog. So the books should be cataloged, said it be searchable, browsable by title, by author, by all of the metadata, and it has it has to have a human librarian. So no library without librarians. So with books ready to be shared, meticulously cataloged, everyone is a librarian. And today there are software tools, at least a calibre, which we, in 10 minutes you just become, in that sense, at least amateur librarian. 
And then, when everyone is a librarian, library is everywhere. That's uh, a fantasy, that's a dream, which continues on some dreams which were already won in the 19th century, which we try to offer here. And there is a lot of um, different kind of technical and other development, which is making proof of concept for making that happen. Okay, M is monk, and uh, we, was, we were speaking yesterday about uh, what is a monk, and a monk is actually someone who, at some point in his life, changes, says, says goodbye to everything that was his life before, his family, his, uh, his uh, wealth, and enters in something else. And um, this is... Um, a movie about an artist, uh, Roman Opalka, and, and, and his county is the one that continues from one to the twelve, the same dimension. The chiefs sont toujours peints à la peinture blanche, avec un pinceau sur le fond uni, partant du noir. Et de à chaque toile de plus en plus clair, se dirigeant vers les plans, vers l'invisibilité absolue qui dura si elle est atteinte jusqu'à la fin de ma vie. Dziewięć, 
90, 90, 900, 90, 6, 3 miliony, 900, 90, 9000, 900, 90, 7, 3 miliony, 900, 90, 9000, 900, 90, 8, 3 miliony, 900, 90, 9000, 900, 90, 9. Um, 
is not so much nature in the sense of a philosophical concept or, or ecology, but more uh, what, what, what is important for me about this term, or what it all comes down to in the end, is, is the human body. And um, because I would say that since you, you mentioned language, these are things that we invent. There are things, uh, and, and we are our ideas, but we also are our body. So a human body is what pulls us down or gives us gravity to nature, to connect us. So one of the one of the things that you made, one of the points that you made very strongly, you said was important to you was the idea of the library in the library. And there was a short sentence that you used in one of our discussions when you said, "It has to be a person, otherwise you lose." against Amazon and the other companies. So you are a hacker, a, tech, a techno freak who believes in the value and the importance of the of human. <laughs> Absolutely. I, yeah, I mean, in that, I, I can just uh, add that again. Uh, for me, uh, also if, if I really be brave enough and say that there is no difference in between machine and the person. And I would refer, for example, to the work of uh, Richard Dawkins in Selfish Gene and then a phenotype, of, uh, something phenotype, I forgot the name of the, of the book, where it's hard actually to see where is that border of the body, of the genital. What's, for example, the, the beaver makes a dam and it seems that it's imprinted in its genotype. So it cannot live without that dam. So where is the border of that body? That, that's what, so I, I think that, again, it's, there is a lot about that. But when I care about body and people, it's more like from communist perspective. I, I care about solidarity. I, I care about people. Uh, and I, I make a diff, I, I Whenever I kind of fantasize about the body, cyborgs, whatever, if I, if I completely wipe out any border, there is still like a very uh, intuitive notion and idea of, uh, of, of, of a person for me, of a human being, which is like, uh, and uh, in that sense, a human as alive, uh, as, 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 as the absolute uh, priority. And in that sense, I like to get into the struggle with uh, religious and crazy, uh, irrational people about that life, you know, about the life, about like who is actually most into the life. And I think that that's left to the, uh, these days, to the, to the right wing too much. And I would like to see it uh, raising and struggling for that, uh, through solidarity from the left. Are our five minutes already up? Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, good. So I won't reply. <laughs> <laughs> that's how it is. This is open.
That's it. <laughs> Came back. Subliminal. Subliminal. Okay. Uh, yeah, as you can see, we struggle with the machines here. And uh, we were struggling going through this alphabet. Um, so, so, at this moment, I was supposed to say something about uh, M. Uh, sorry, about P. And I have chosen to, to do a paper machines. But then, in order to... In order to explain you paper machines, I need something from the rep, like from T, which is like a Turing universal machine. So then we were just like uh, discussing how we can do that. So I will just do 10 minutes at this moment. Uh, and that will be T plus P, so T comes from the future in order to explain the, um, in order to explain P. P. So as you can see, I talk a lot about machines. So it's like uh, here you have a Turing machine and also you have a, 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 a paper machine. So a Turing machine is a concept, idea, kind of abstract idea. And so even it says that it's a machine, it's not a machine as we kind of, as we feel it as a machine. So Turing machine consists of the following components. It has a finite set of states, with one state marked as a start state by running. <clears throat> and Turing machine always has a current state. It has an infinite state with storage cells and read-write device that can move on the page. So this read-write device you can imagine just like a head, which is able to read and write on that like a position uh, below. And then a definition of so-called transition function. You can also imagine that as some kind of a table which will say which symbol will be trans uh, 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 in, in which transition to another symbol, how the symbol uh, uh, will be replaced. And uh, so as I told you, it's a, um, okay. it's a concept. But here, oh, I'm sorry. Here you will see a machine. This is an example of a simple binary accounting program. The machine starts with a tape that has 1011 written on it. Uh, let me just explain a few things. So here you see the machine which tries to illustrate the concept which is called a Turing machine. So this machine is not a Turing machine. It is illustration, like a, so you can find it in text by Alan Turing, but here it's like an illustration as you would make it into the, a visual object. That is 11 in binary. After the default tape is written, it reads to the right looking for the least significant bit of the number. It then follows two simple rules. If it reads a 1, it changes it to a 0, and moves to the left one cell. If it reads a zero, it changes it to a one, and reads again to the right, looking for the least significant bit. The program halts when it finds a blank cell to the left of a cell it just wrote a zero in. It then writes a one and the program stops. So let me try to explain what happened here. Uh, so <clears throat> this illustration of a Turing machine, you can see this is like an illustration of, uh, that was an illustration of, uh, just remember that uh, image illustration of that uh, never-ending tape 
and then there is a head, and then there are rules, very simple rules. So this was the program which was counting in binary, these zeros and ones in binary, which was going from 1011, which is in decimal 11, and will end uh, in, when, when it reached 16, which is 10000, and that's it. So that program was a program that illustration was programmed by, 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 by the program which uh, follows simple rules and it says, so five more, it says if it reads one, it changes it to zeros and moves to the left one cell. If it reads zero, if that head finds zero, it changes it to one and reads again to the right, looking for the least significant bit of the number. Then if it finds blank cell, it writes one and the program stops. So now you don't have to figure out and you don't have to become a Turing machine which is processing that. But what is important is just to understand it was like a very simple program which was run on that illustration of a Turing machine uh, and it was illustrating that concept. So what we can say is that conceptually everything what happened in the history of computing of today, conceptually, can go back to this illustration, to that concept with Alan Turing kind of uh, made up or just imagined in 1936. So the difference is how we can have like a Google Earth uh, program, satellite images, Street View, uh, Siri on an iPhone and all of that. So the difference is that, that the machines, by time, gets quicker, get, gets more powerful. So they can paper. do... Sorry? Paper machine. No, no, no. The machine. <laughs> the, the I, I'm talking about the time. Okay, yeah. I, 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 will get, I will get to that. So what we should imagine is just a huge acceleration which happens. So huge amount of operation happens. And again, it doesn't happen... So there is no like a... Just like when you have TV, there is no like a, a little people in TV. There is no little people there. Also, there is no a little Turing machine as this illustration in our computers. But conceptually, it is. Conceptually, so if there is equivalent, there is analogy here. So, I have here this book, it's called Zettel Wirtschaft? Wirtschaft? Zettel Wirtschaft of Paper Machines. It's a great media theory in a way that, um, that Markus Krajewski finds in the history of a card catalog. So card catalog for the libraries and card catalog as in used in businesses. He finds the similarities in between these concepts, uh, 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 idea and implementation of the card catalog, and he says it is a predecessor of a computer. So conceptually, he makes a very strong points and statements where he finds the equivalents and analogies in the invention of a card catalog, for example, that book is not the card catalog because there is no random access as you, as you know it in a computer. But with a card catalog, when it's just a card, you can really quickly get to any and also you can move it. You can start the process information just like you would, that, you would do that on a computer stack. So in that sense, it's a very powerful uh, imagination which makes the computer conceptually into the history. It's a, as I said, a great media theory, in the history of another technology, which is card catalog, which was kind of forgotten at one moment, but it was really improving the idea. It was innovating in that simple space. It was struggling. So some people would say, no, card catalog should be like a book. You should make a big book and then like, uh, 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 write down all of, these, like, uh, all of these items. And then there was another, uh, uh, usually guy, um, <clears throat> whatever that brings into this story, and which would, have, which would say, no, 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 it should be a card, it should be replaceable. But then you should imagine also that these cards, that there was a problem of making the cards same size. So now it's like we have a manufacturing, whatever, like industrial revolution, but at some moment in history, making the cards always the same size, so that it's easy to operate, was a huge problem. And someone who had the idea that cards should be of the same size, was also struggling with the others by insisting on that 
characteristic of that property of the card catalog, even the technology of that day was not ready to make it. So in that sense, it's a beautiful story where there is no anymore like a bordering between card catalogs, idea of a card catalog, of processing information, of that random access memory, and going just following up with the Turing machine with all of these computers. Yeah, and I thought that was very interesting that when you told me the story the, the first time, I thought it was very interesting because uh, I linked it that to uh, aesthetics and to uh, Jacques Rancière, who in his book uh, uh, Politics of Aesthetics actually says that in the 19th century uh, uh, some writers were actually already making cinema because they were uh, uh, writing in, in a way and on subjects where, uh, 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 where the masses, where, the, 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 uh, where there was no more protagonists but everybody in the, in the, in the novel would have the same uh, 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 importance and where uh, 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 this was preparing actually the, the ground for uh, a mechanical uh, for mechanical art, you may say. And I'm going to read a little bit out of uh, this book. In order for the mechanical arts to be able to confer visibility on the masses, or rather on anonymous individuals, they first need to be recognized as arts. That is to say, that they first need to be put into practice and recognized as something other than techniques of, of reproduction or transmission. This does the same principle that confers visibility on absolutely anyone and allows for photography and film to become arts. We can even reverse the formula. It is because the anonymous became the subject matter of art that the act of recording such a subject matter can be an art. The fact that what is anonymous is not only susceptible to becoming the subject matter of art but also conveys a specific beauty is an exclusive characteristic of the aesthetic regime of the arts. Not only did the aesthetic regime begin well before the arts of mechanical reproduction, but it is actually this regime that made them possible by its new way of thinking art and its subject matter. The aesthetic regime of the arts was initially the breakdown of the system of representation, that is to say, of a system where the dignity of the subject matter dictated the dignity of genre of representation, the tragedy for the nobles, the comedy for the people of meager means, historical painting versus genre painting, etc. Along with genres, the system of representation defined the situations and form of expression that were appropriate for the loneliness or, or loftiness of the subject matter. The aesthetic regime of the art dismantled this correlation between subject matter and mode of representation. This revolution first took place in literature, an epoch and, and society were deciphered through the features, clothes, or gestures, gestures of an ordinary individual, like in Balzac. The sewer revealed a civiliz civilization, like Hugo. The daughter of a farmer and the daughter of a banker were caught in the equal force of a style as an absolute manner of things by Flaubert. All these forms of cancellation or reversal of the opposition between high and low not only antedate the powers of mechanical reprodu reproduction, they made it possible for this reproduction to be more than mechanical reproduction with the reproduction. In order for a technological mode of action and reproduction, a way of doing and making to be qualified as falling within the domain of art, be it a certain use of words or of a camera, it is first necessary for the subject matter to be defined as such, etc. Et we go to.
four, and I remember that Jan suggested that uh, R, that the interesting one would be breast, as in like a garbage, a residual. <clears throat> and then again, it just, I think that followed uh, the same kind of um, line of thought of uh, nature, and then it was not about technological, but this one maybe would be. So it was just like, a, in a way, uh, offered to me like, okay, let's let's do something. And I, uh, I just went with the kind of first association which I was interested. So I'm not interested in trying to like uh, get like a, into the a big definition of something about the rest, but more like a small, small, uh, specific uh, a thing here. And that's about like how something which was, uh, which which destiny destiny was to like rest to like get this, the dominant logic. So I will just show you how, how that happens. And that's what I said as kind of the first association. I said uh, that, it, uh, that these products are getting into the a luxury kind of category. So they should be thrown away from kind of a history or whatever. It's not, uh, 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 it shouldn't be here, but they stay. And their price goes up. Not necessarily by market logic of masses, but actually of the market logic where very few are ready to pay a lot. So the price goes up, not just because a lot of people want something, but also price goes up if people are ready to pay it. So this is just uh, one example of that. This is an uh, electron uh, uh, seat station, it's a musical synthesis sound model. So you were hearing some of these. Uh, this is the sound of a microchip from Commodore 64. It was a computer in um, in 90, uh, 1980s, and uh, people were making music on that. People were playing music during the games. It was super popular. But that microchip is also cheap, and it's not really the state of the art of uh, of of sound of sound technology. But anyway, it got fetishized. It got people really like that sound. It has that strong. <laughs> So these companies started to make these kind of uh, uh, synthesizers. They would just put that chip into this new box, but it, the chip is from the 80s, and then it would start to sell it. And what is interesting is that uh, it started in 1999, and then they said, okay, we have only 100 left. And because it's from the 80s, uh, uh, the, the, it's not manufactured anymore. So they would say, we will laser etch these, and then we will sell it. So like last hundred. But then, <laughs> they found in March 2005, uh, they claimed that uh, they found another hundred. Uh, and then they also sold it for like uh, uh, 920 euros or 950 US dollars. And people were buying that. And then they did the same trick in late 2006. Where they said, okay, this is really the final one because they were advertising that as the final hundred, so it actually became three times final hundred, and they were always successful. So what we can say how how this chip doesn't go to the to the to the rest, to the to the garbage, to the to, to the history. Now it will just like stay on eBay. It will stay not necessarily from the Swedish company, but people will just uh, and we will see what will be the what will be the price. So they didn't, they didn't find new, the last hundred, the new ones? Uh, no, no, no. From 2006, uh, they didn't find it. If you bought it, you are safe. Okay. <laughs> you never know. Uh, we arrived at S and U, because he had 10 minutes, so now I have 10 minutes. Uh, uh, S is the sublime. And um, it was interesting in, in our, in our uh, interaction because uh, the first night when we, were, or the first day when we uh, 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 ate there at the Turk, you said something that really struck me. You said, uh, yeah, um, the sublime and aesthetics, that's really something for when communists will, 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 uh, will be arrived. But when now, now finally when, when communists when, when communists, when communists will finally be arrived, we can get busy with that kind of children things. 
<laughs> but no, sorry, that's an yeah. interpretation. But uh, but 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 uh, but now we do uh, in, um, serious things. And uh, I, I was I uh, I've been busy a lot with, with the Sublime in, in uh, uh, since a few years, and uh, I, I, I did a lecture performance about the Sublime. And what uh, the, the tradition from which I was seeing the sublime was this Kantian tradition, like referring to, to, to the experience of nature. And um, uh, where, it was, where, where the sublime is an aesthetic experience. Uh, and what, what was interesting to me was what, with what we were left with an experience of the sublime. And, I, and my conclusion was always that we were like in a position of weakness, of incapable of any action or passive. That, Actually, this delightful horror that the sublime is uh, has had a, has an authority on us and is making us like mere consumers. So, in that sense, I understood also what uh, what uh, your your uh, uh, remark. And the other day, I found this uh, newspaper at the at the, at the art school where that when I'm uh, teaching. And yeah, now you don't see anything, but it's uh, it's a, a newspaper by um, it's it brought out by uh, Sto Dilat. It's like an act, a, a Russian activist and artist group, and you see like the Vandalov in the Nebelmeer above. What is what seems to be uh, uh, the Arab Spring or uh, uh, Taxing Square? Or so they are, this newspaper is actually analyzing um, the sublime from the, from another point of view that comes more, more from your tradition, and which is um, it's been said at some point that actually the sublime. I I, start, I try to find it back. Um, I think it's on the back of it. Yeah, 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 but it's also, also here. Uh, there is not, nothing can be more sublime than the people's struggle for like, liberation. So that there is another sublime, which is actually uh, uh, crowds, and that's, that's what they do, crowds coming together and uh, fighting, let's say. And then in this newspaper it's interesting because they say, yeah, the sublime is also in the Kantian way, it's, all, it's always like this delightful horror, like something you, you feel attracted to, but at the same time you, you, uh, uh, you fear it, or you, you, there is an uncanniness. And uh, here they say, yeah, what, what the, the, the sublime, these crowds, when they become ugly, what happens there? Then the, the, the aesthetics change, and um, we don't know yet what happens. So, and now I'm going. I'm going to go to the next one, which is a reading. If I find it back. So the next one is about, is universalism. Um, the endings of sensible nerves in the skins of vertebrates. The circulation of blood, especially as observed in the minute and capillary vessels of batrachia and of the fishes. Physiological and clinical research on the cephalorachidic and cerebrospinal liquid. Sexual, the sexual life of aquatic salamanders and the development of the tadpole of these salamanders from the egg to the adult animal. The theory of the transmutation of species. The Kafirs of the Amazulu, the Amaponda, and the Amakosa tribes. The discoveries made in the sepulchral cavern of Saint Jean d'Alacas and the dolmen of Pilande and of Costes, witness of the last period of the Neolithic age in the Aveyron region. The palafits of riparian constructions on the lake of Neuchâtel. The osteography of the way the beach on the east of the harbor of Ostend on the 4th of November, 1827. The stretch of nocturnal birds of prey. The natural history of paradise birds and rollers, of toucans and the barbered vultures. 
the mythological origins, customs, migrations, philology, physiology and anatomy of the Pisidaeus, Picunames, Yunkines and Torcons, the so-called mechanical poisons of muscles, the natural history of the fish known to inhabit the seas and fresh waters of India, Burma and Ceylon, the history of the common fly in our apartments, a new method of classifying the hymenopathy hymeno and the dipterans, an essay on the anatomy of the caterpillar which eats into the wood of willows, the British wild wasp, the rarest moth in Georgia, their metamorphosis with the plants they eat, the dentition of snails, the 24 species of short-tailed crabs in the Red Sea, fresh water octopuses with arms in the forms of horns, a description of the mango stand and the breadfruit. The first is deemed to, to be the most delicious, the other the most useful of all the fruits in the East Indies. The description of several plants harvested on the occasion of the expedition of Tine on the shore of Bar el Ghazal and the affluence in Central Africa. The cryptogamic flora of Flanders. The system of mushrooms and sponges. The Book of the Great Sea Dragons, <coughs> the extinct monsters of the ancient earth, fossil reptiles and mammals which have been found in Virgin Bay, the accurate charts and plans of Newfoundland, Labrador, the Gulf and River of Saint Laurent, the ceremonial used in Japan for weddings and funerals followed by details of the Dacite power, the narrative of the Arctic land expedition to the mouth of the Great Fish River, and along the shores of the Arctic Ocean in the years 1833, 1843 and 1835. A voyage of discovery made under the orders of Admiralit in His Majesty's ship Isabella and Alexander for the purpose of exploring Baffin's Bay and inquiring into the probability of a northwest passage. The narrative of a sailor who was wrecked on the western coast of Africa in the year 1810 was detained three years in slavery by the Arabs of the Great Desert and resided several months in the city of Timbuktu. The travels and adventures in the Persian provinces in the southern banks of the Caspian Sea. An account of a voyage of, a, of discovery to the west coast of Korea and the great Lu Chu Island. The book of Marco Polo, citizen of Venice, private counselor and general imperial commissioner of Kublai Khan drafted in French under his dictation in 1989 by Rusticien de Pise. The Russians of the River Amur, its discovery, conquest and colonization was a description of the country, its inhabitants, production and commercial capabilities. An account of an embassy to the court of the Teshu Lama in Tibet, containing a narrative of a journey to Bhutan and part of Tibet. A diary of a winter's route. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we are kind where of goals. Goals. Just a second. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> we are V, a visual machine. So. Yeah, I think that. <clears throat> What I like about the um, war, sorry, I don't, I don't make it now. I just don't run it. It's just like something that yeah. happened soon. I just uh, a little reference to war and, and then Bekushet. They were really exhausting. Some of these like uh, like trap. They 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 they're doing these attempts to get somewhere to know what the great literature, and then they would go somewhere and then like stop and saying like this is boring. I don't understand it. So I kind of, I, I, I like that, and at the same time I hated that because I always felt like, oh, I'm also uh, wasting my time just reading this. Uh, and then I like that when we get there, and that there, is that, that there is that tension. So I think that this is the, maybe there is one more later, but this is the further I can go with, the, with something which is just exhausting, which I have to tell you, 
tell you mm -hmm. for the second or third time and tell you for the first time. And it's, it's about a virtual machine. I love this story. I don't know how, how much you will get because it's hard to, yeah, to so say. Let's start, let's start the time now then. Okay, yeah, <laughs> great. So, <laughs> I'll make it shorter, I hope. So, it's about a virtual machine. It's again about a, what's the machine. You know, we, when we uh, like, try to imagine the machine, it's usually something which is mechanical, moves around. And we already saw that there is like a conceptual machine, and it's called machine, there's a Turing machine. Then we saw the real machine, which is actually illustration of that conceptual machine. And that was, the, that, was that like a, like a loud uh, type, and like that the numbers, uh, ones, and, which was counting. You, you remember that. So, <clears throat> I'd like to tell you when the virtual machine as a term, as an idea, kind of a, a, a study. It was like a late 60s and IBM, so hardware was always going somewhere. So, in Turing, there, is like, there are no constraints, just like in card catalog. So, maybe you can do in card catalog everything we ever did in computers. But with card catalog, even if it's possible, we don't completely know, but maybe it will take thousands of years, so it doesn't make sense. So it's really about like a, when some machine, the real machine, is powerful enough to run something. So we got to the, in the late 60s, with powerful enough hardware, and it was a IBM CP40, which was powerful enough to run a software on top of, of itself. So there is a machine, there is a hardware, like a, a sil uh, silicon microchips or like a processor, which was powerful enough to run a software which is emulation of that same hardware. So if you would be a software from outside of that system, and if you would ask something from that system, you wouldn't be able to understand if that was a hardware or software, because software was exactly the same like hardware. But in order to get there, we had to have a hardware powerful enough to actually run that software so that it makes sense. And if they did it 10 years before, it would be so slow that it's just like completely like useless. Okay. So that's when it started. So then you have like a number of virtual machines which were getting in 70s, 80s, 90s. And now we are like 2008 or something. So what we can say here, I have a hardware. This is my laptop. On top of that, like, uh, or like on top of this hardware, I have an operating system, Linux. It could be Windows or S10 or whatever, and it emulates operating system emulates a hardware almost like universally. That's why you have drivers. So if you write a software, you say to to your operating system, print this page, and usually it just prints it out. Even you have different printers all around. So in a sense, operating system is a virtual machine. So I'm running a virtual machine of operating system on top of this hardware. Uh, it's Linux. And then I have a browser. And inside of the browser, there is another virtual machine, which is called JavaScript virtual machine. And that's the programming language which you can, in which you can program your web pages. That's like, like a, for example, Gmail, if you remember it, when it appeared. That was the first thing which we didn't call anymore web page, but web application, because it was like so kind of interactive and whatever. And we got it because it was written in a JavaScript, in a virtual machine, which was able to run applications, not anymore just like a show you the text and images and things like that. So the JavaScript was, of course, slow in 1997, 8, 2003, we got Gmail. But then at one moment, JavaScript and our computers, together with JavaScript virtual machine, got powerful enough that this guy, uh, uh, Fabrice, but just I remember this name, Fabrice Pilar, fantastic guy. So what he did is that he wrote in JavaScript emulation of a process of Intel processor. So Intel processor is back here in my uh, hardware. Then there is an operating system running, and then there is a browser running inside of the operating system. Then there is a Java, JavaScript virtual machine which can represent anything ever in, in, in computers. And then in that JavaScript, that guy wrote emulation of a processor. And then that processor loads a Linux inside of this page. So it's the same kind of Linux which I'm running on my laptop. 
So this is the Linux inside of a Linux here. And not just that it's a Linux inside of a Linux, I can actually use it. So it's, it's, it's running just the same way like I'm running it on my computer. And then there is a compiler, a tiny C or GCC. That means that we can write C programming language inside of this a web page or web application, which is JavaScript virtual machine, in which we have a relation of that, pro of that processor, Intel processor, and we can actually recreate everything ever written in the history of computers in this window. It will take quite some time. <laughs> also, it won't be able to run it. So if you just run another emulation of that, it will just too slow. Just it won't be able to run it. But we can program it inside of this. And I love it. And I don't know how much you could follow, but I just decided that I, I, I have to share that with you. And I will just show you a little program. This is the program, which is written in C, and we can compile it. I can do, also it says here, TCC, TCC, then it will make program which is called Hello, and it will interpret this same uh, C code. And then the only thing which this will do is it will print out hello world. It will just say hello world. And now it takes quite some time. This is a super simple program, but it <coughs> works in the same way like everything works on my computer. And that's, yeah, it's, it's done. It's great. So I will just uh, run it. I will do hello. This is the new application in this. And it says hello world. So, <laughs> yeah, I will just stop here. I, I just, I, I, I have to share this, this with you. This is, the, this is fantastic. Thank you. Okay. Uh, can, you can you like a blank, right? Yeah, if it's possible. Like yeah, of course. Um, uh, I need like a second. I also need a second. That's good. Uh, Okay, this is um, something much less complex than what you just uh, showed us. It's uh, actually one camera uh, movement, mm -hmm. which uh, I also love, because inside of this camera movement, there's very few happening, but a lot. And uh, so this, uh, by the way, this was this is V, W, actually W, and it's walk. Now I have to find it back. Sorry.
So it's kind of a cheap way to like uh, get great into that whole like dynamics. I don't have to do any gifts anymore. It's like huge. So anyway, it's huge in many ways. It's cultish. But so you have it for for life. For <laughs> yeah, whatever. Yeah. So <clears throat> you have a wiki which explains every one of these, and it's a wiki. Anyone can try to like explain what's going on in these. There are like more than a thousand and, and something. And there, there is a lot. Uh, 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 uh. Randall Monroe is like a genius. So you can see here also that there is an explanation. And then people come up, and not necessarily great explanations. Many times they are just wrong. They also like are, are just prove what was the point there. So if there is a point that someone is just like narrow-minded or just OCD, and then you can see in the comments that it's just getting even more OCD. So this is the phenomena, which is not unknown, but is also unknown. It's called XKCD, and uh, I recommend to uh, check it out. Good. Now we have why, and why uh, we didn't find anything. I thought I would talk about Yugoslavia, but I don't feel really uh, pointed to that. So I asked you. But you told me, yeah, uh, you can do that, but it's also not so... I will just go for the why is unspeakable. Yeah. And the list says here, oh, well, good timing, so... I'll so why, why is it unspeakable in the Deleuze uh, a, a, ABC? Yeah, yeah. And uh, maybe we can just uh, then go for what we prepare for the... For the set. Yeah, for the end. Uh, I mean, we can talk about... Oh, no. Whatever. Just uh, this is Z. It's zoom. Um, you don't have sound? Uh, I'll just. Hit it. It's zoom. It's Z axis. That uh, it takes more than five minutes. But any moment you want to like finish this, uh, you can go. But it's not much longer than five minutes, so... Yeah, that's what the picnic near the lakeside in Chicago was the start of a lazy afternoon, early 1 October. 9.30. We begin with a scene one meter wide, which we view from just one meter away. Now every 10 seconds we will look from 10 times farther away, and our field of view will be 10 times wider. This square is 10 meters wide, and in 10 seconds the next square will be 10 times as wide. Center on the picnickers, even after they've been lost to sight. 100 meters wide. The distance a man can run in 10 seconds. Cars crowd the highway. Powerboats lie at their docks. The colorful bleachers are soldiers' field. This square is a kilometer wide, 1,000 meters. The distance a racing car can travel in 10 seconds. We see the great city on the lake shore. 10 to the fourth meters, 10 kilometers. The distance a supersonic airplane can travel in 10 seconds. We see first the rounded end of Lake Michigan, then the whole Great Lake, 10 to the fifth meters. The distance an orbiting satellite covers in 10 seconds. Long parades of clouds, the day's weather in the Middle West. 10 to the sixth, a one with six zeros, a million meters. Soon the Earth will show as a solid sphere. We are able to see the whole Earth now just over a minute along the journey. The Earth diminishes into the distance, but those background stars are so much farther away that they do not yet appear to move. A line extends at the true speed of light. In one second, it half crosses the tilted orbit of the moon. a small part of the path in which the Earth moves about the Sun. Now the orbital paths of the neighbor planets, Venus and Mars, then Mercury. Entering our field of view is the glowing center of our solar system, the Sun, followed by the massive outer planets, swinging wide in their big orbits. That our orbit belongs to Pluto. A fringe of a myriad comets too faint to see completes the solar system. Ten to the fourteenth. 
As the solar system shrinks to one bright point in the distance, our sun is plainly now only one among the stars. Looking back from here, we note four southern constellations, still much as they appear from the far side of the Earth. This square is 10 to the 16th meters, one light year, not yet out to the next star. Our last 10 second step took us 10 light years further. The next will be 100. Our perspective changes so much in each step now that even the background stars will appear to converge. At last, we pass the bright star Arcturus and some stars of the Dipper. Normal but quite unfamiliar stars and clouds of gas surround us as we traverse the Milky Way galaxy. Giant steps carry us into the outskirts of the galaxy. And as we pull away, we begin to see the great flat spiral facing us. The time and path we chose to leave Chicago has brought us out of the galaxy along a course nearly perpendicular to its disk. The two little satellite galaxies of our own are the clouds of Magellan. 10 to the 22nd power, a million light years. Groups of galaxies bring a new level of structure to the scene. Glowing points are no longer single stars, but whole galaxies of stars seen as one. We pass the big Virgo cluster of galaxies among many others, a hundred million light years out. As we approach the limit of our vision, we pause to start back home. This lonely scene, the galaxies like dust, is what most of space looks like. This emptiness is normal. The richness of our own neighborhood is the exception. The trip back to the picnic on the lakefront will be a sped up version, reducing the distance to the Earth's surface by one power of 10 every two seconds. In each two seconds, we'll appear to cover 90% of the remaining distance back to Earth. Notice the alternation between great activity and relative inactivity, a rhythm that will continue all the way into our next goal, a proton in the nucleus of a carbon atom beneath the skin on the hand of the sleeping man at the picnic. And the eighth, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. We are back at our starting point. We slow up at one meter, ten to the zero power. Now we reduce the distance to our final destination by 90% every 10 seconds each step much smaller than the one before. At 10 to the minus 2, 1 one hundredth of a meter, 1 centimeter, we approach the surface of the hand. In a few seconds, we'll be entering the skin, crossing layer after layer from the outermost dead cells into a tiny blood vessel within. Skin layers vanish in turn an outer layer of cells, felty collagen. The capillary containing red blood cells and a roughly lymphocyte. We enter the white cell. Among its vital organelles, the porous wall of the cell nucleus appears. The nucleus within holds the heredity of the man in the coiled coils of DNA. As we close in, we come to the double helix itself. A molecule like a long, twisted ladder whose rungs of paired bases spell out twice in an alphabet of four letters the words of the powerful genetic message. At the atomic scale, the interplay of form and motion becomes more visible. We focus on one commonplace group of three hydrogen atoms bonded by electrical forces to a carbon atom. Four electrons make up the outer shell of the carbon itself. They appear in quantum motion as a swarm of shimmering points. At 10 to the minus 10 meters, one angstrom, we find ourselves right among those outer electrons. Now we come upon the two inner electrons held in a tighter swarm. As we draw toward the atom's attracting center, we enter upon a vast inner space. At last, the carbon nucleus, so massive and so small, this carbon nucleus is made up of six protons and six neutrons. We are in the domain of universal mind.
molecules. There are protons and neutrons in every nucleus, electrons in every atom. Atoms bond them to every molecule out to the farthest galaxy. As a single proton fills our seed, we reach the edge of present understanding. Are these some quarks in intense interaction? Our journey has taken us through 40 powers of 10. If now the field is one unit, then when we saw many clusters of galaxies together, it was 10 to the 40th, or 1 and 40 zeros.